begin by talking a little bit about some policy. And I'm going to start by, um, uh, by talking about uh, the independent inquiry into access to healthcare for people with learning disabilities, which was published in 2008. And um, why I think that inquiry was quite important. Um, and it was chaired by Sir Jonathan Michael and set up by the Secretary of, S of State uh, for Health, Patricia Hewitt. And the reason she set it up was to see if the problems that had been raised by MENCAP's extraordinary report, Death by Indifference, which Lloyd was involved in, um, and there have been further reports, but Death by Indifference, which um, described how six people had died because um, their needs had not been properly understood and recognized in hospital care. Um, and so she set up the inquiry to see, are these problems ones that happen in other places too? Okay. Um, I was on the um, expert committee for this um, inquiry. And of course, if you th remember, this inquiry is in the context of a very important white paper valuing people, which had been published in 2001. Um, now, that white paper actually only had one chapter about health, chapter six. Um, but it made some recommendations, which actually the, this inquiry um, supported. So what did the Michael Inquiry found? Well, it found that people with learning disabilities have, do indeed have worse health and get worse care. Um, we knew that. That staff knowledge, knowledge and attitudes are poor. That staff have too little training. And importantly, and this is something I'm going to return to again several times, is that reasonable adjustments are not made to services despite the law. Now, what I just wanted to ask is, is that, do people here know what reasonable adjustments are? Can I just put your hands up if you know what a reasonable adjustment is? Great. You see, you're a really well-informed audience. Normally, when I ask that question, people don't know what it means. And indeed, if you were to ask um, general staff in an acute hospital what, what was meant by reasonable adjustment, they probably wouldn't know. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, I've been involved in a study for the last three years, uh, funded by the National Institute for Health Research, and the findings of this study are going to be published um, in December. Um, and what it did was to evaluate four of the recommendations made by Sir Jonathan Michael's um, inquiry. Um, and th these are the headlines, really, which are that um, in uh, 2013, so that's uh, what, five years after his inquiry made a number of recommendations, um, that in, in a national study of six hospitals, um, that um, we found that patient safety is still being put at risk when uh, learning disability is not known about and not identified, and that reasonable adjustments are still not being made, and that staff knowledge and attitudes are still poor. Okay, Now, um, of course, the other, one of the inquiry, uh, inquiry recommendations was to set up a confidential inquiry. Now, the confidential inquiry, the idea of a confidential inquiry was first proposed in valuing people. And the government said that it was interested in the idea and would look at the feasibility of it. But by 2005, it still hadn't done anything about it. And then Sir Jonathan Michael recommended it again. And so they did set up a confidential inquiry, but only for three years. And... Um, you know, there are confidential inquiries, and the idea of them, of course, is that they can find out what's actually happening and why people are dying when they shouldn't. But they're able to feed that information back into services so that people know what to do better. Okay? And the, we've got a long history of confidential inquiries in this country. Some of them have been going for more than 50 years. Okay? And they've had, a they've had a really good impact on changing the way in which people are provided with care. But this inquiry was only funded for three years. It's the only short-term confidential inquiry set up, which is terrible. So there's still um, a lobby of government to try to get them to make this confidential inquiry uh, permanent. Okay? What did it find? Well, it found that men with learning disabilities are dying on average 13 years earlier than other people in society who have the same condition. Okay? It didn't find that people were presenting late with their symptoms, it found that they were getting fewer investigations and less treatment, okay? and that women were dying on average 20 years earlier. Now, I did a study, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, looking at um, age and cause of death, 
um, for um, adults with learning disabilities in three London boroughs. And I found it a really shocking statistic, which I can never quite get my head around, but it was that people with learning disabilities were 58 times more likely to die before the age of 50 than other people in society. Okay, so this is, this is there's the same kind of evidence coming, um, coming again and again and again, and still we don't seem to be able to get it right. Well, there are two acts, and they're quite recent acts of Parliament, and I think that they are really important um, because, um, you know, we have targets in our services and uh, tick boxes and so on, but they don't actually have the same power as an act of Parliament. So these two acts of Parliament, the Mental Capacity Act and the Equality Act, which I'll come to next, um, require that uh, people's um, uh, uh, capacity and um, individual needs are really carefully thought about in the provision of services. And it, it, applies, to, um, it applies to a particular decision. So you can't say about somebody that they are always lacking capacity. You can only say that they lack capacity for one decision or another, okay? Um, but in, before you decide that the person lacks capacity, you can, you, you're supposed to um, actually make sure that you've given that person every possible chance to be able to understand what it is that you want them to know. And that means that you're going to have to take time and you're going to have to provide information to them in a way that they can understand it. Okay? It might, and there are a number of things that you might do. It might mean that you have to have the right person with them to support them. Um, it might mean that you simply provide the information in, um, in, a, in, a, in a different form. Um, at the moment, the Mental Capacity Act is undergoing post-legislative scrutiny. Um, basically, all that means is that um, uh, a select committee in, in the Houses of Parliament is examining the legislation finding out, taking evidence, is it working? And if so, um, could it be made any better? Okay? I'm sitting on that committee at the moment, um, and some of the sorts of things that we've been talking about are whether, um, whether it's better rather than thinking about best people's best interest, or having best interest meetings, whether it would be better to be thinking about benefit um, and shared decision making. So sometimes the language that's used and the processes we set up don't necessarily lead to the right kind of um, outcome. The Equality Act, 2010, uh, and this incorporates um, the Disability Discrimination Act from 2005. And of course, people with disabilities um, are, amongst, are, are amongst those with protected characteristics. And basically, what that means is that all public services must make reasonable adjustments to support people with protected characteristics to be able to access that service. Um, again, a lot of people just haven't quite understood the, um, the, the, um, the implications of this legislation. Okay? And I suspect we will see case law um, developing in the uh, years to come. So some examples of reasonable adjustments, you probably have your favorite. Um, I'm focusing on information because I'm going to talk a bit more about um, information in the context of health inequalities later. Um, but um, hospital passports, of course, are increasingly popular. Um, one of the um, issues that was uh, suggested by um, the Michael inquiry was that people with learning disabilities need to be identified and that hospitals and other services should try to find a way of identifying people. And what's really interesting in, in our study at St. George's was that um, a lot of the nurses we talked to felt that it was stigmatizing to identify people. They didn't see any purpose in identifying people. And one of our proposals, and it's something I've felt for a long time, particularly perhaps as a parent of a, of a man with um, a learning disability, is that it's not so much the label that, that, uh, that matters. What matters is what you need to do differently in order to be able to help him to use the service. In other words, the reasonable adjustment. So I think that instead of identifying people by a label, which could then just simply be a label, it's a little bit like the challenging behavior. Once you've got challenging behavior, you've got the label. But it, doesn't, it sometimes seems to stop people thinking. And I wonder whether instead of stopping people thinking, actually to turn it round and, say, and ask the question, what would we need to do differently 
in order that this person would successfully be able to have a blood test or um, you know, take their medication or um, have a CT scan or you know, whatever it might be. What are the adjustments we'd need to make and how are we going to do that? How can we plan for that? Whose advice do we need to take? 